Okay, so I'll just give you a rundown of the, uh, the schedule for the evening, and well, I'll first introduce the speakers. So Dan Marker started out as an evangelist at the age of 15. He received a degree in religion from Azusa Pacific University and was ordained to the ministry at, uh, in 1975. He preached for 19 years before gradu gradually outgrowing his religious beliefs, and he's written several books about the experience. These include Godless, How an Evangelical Preacher Became One of America's Leading Atheists, and most recently, The Good Atheist, Living a Purpose-Filled Life Without God. He's now the co-president of the Freedom From Religion Foundation and co-hosts Free Thought Radio, a national weekly show on the Air American Network. He also gives lectures and participates in debates around the country, and tonight he's excited to participate in his 97th annual debate. And Hamza Tsortsis is a public speaker on Islam, a researcher, a writer, and an activist. Hamza has debated various academics and intellectuals and delivers presentations on topics ranging from does God exist to can we live better lives without religion. Hamza was brought up in London and attended school and college in the area. He studied psychology at the University of Westminster and went on to study Western and Islamic philosophy. He is married with two children. So those are the debaters. Um, the format of the debate will go like this. Uh, we'll have opening statements of 20 minutes each. Uh, Hamza will begin. Um, following the opening statements, we'll have uh, a series of rebuttals sort of in reverse order. Uh, so, Dan will begin with the rebuttals. First an eight minute rebuttal, then a five minute rebuttal from each. Um, and then uh, we'll have seven minute closing statements. After the closing statements, uh, we'll pause so that people can leave uh, if they want. Uh, need to pause because the room is not convenient. <laughs> uh, so we'll pause for a few minutes while people uh, leave. Those of you who want to stay for the question and answer period, we'll do question and answer until 10 o'clock. The way the question and answer period will work, you should all have an index card. Right? How many people lack index cards? Some, um, do you want to pass them around? If you, well, the, the idea is you should write down your questions as they occur to you in the debate, the questions that you would like to ask. When we pause after the closing statements, we'll pass the cards up and uh, select some questions, as many as we can fit, uh, before 10 o'clock. We'll break up at 10. Um, for the participants, we have this handy time color coded card system. Green means one minute remaining in your time. Yellow means 30 seconds remaining in your lot of time. Red means stop speaking as soon as possible. I'm colorblind. <laughs> um, Okay, I think then we're ready to begin. Um, the first statement will be Hamza's opening statement of 20 minutes. Um, yeah, enjoy. إن الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله أما بعد رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأخذ الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي Brothers, sisters and friends, I greet you with the warmest Islamic greetings of peace السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Which basically means may the peace and blessings of God be upon you all First and foremost, I'd like to thank you for coming tonight to address a very important question and I'm going to address this question by saying that Islam is more rational because it makes sense of the existence of God. Islam is more rational because it makes sense of the miraculous nature of the Quran, which is the book of the Muslim. Now, Islam makes sense of the existence of God because we have all asked the same questions. Why does something exist rather than nothing? Where did the universe come from? Now, in response to this question, some atheists have claimed the universe is a brute fact. It's eternal. It just is. However, to maintain such a proposition, I argue is untenable because there are very good reasons that the universe was brought into being. 
In other words, it began to exist, its past is non-eternal, it is finite. Now to substantiate this claim, we can bring to our discussion two points. Point number one, the absurdity of an actual infinite history of past events for the universe. And number two, Big Bang cosmology. Now, the universe must be finite because it is absurd to postulate that the universe has an actual infinite history of past events. Let's take the following example to illustrate this point. Now imagine I'm an American football player and before I can pass the ball to one of my teammates, I have to ask permission from my coach. But he has to ask permission also. And if this goes on forever, will I ever pass the ball to my teammate? No, I wouldn't. And this highlights the absurdity of infinite regress of causes. And this applies to events too. Therefore, there cannot be an infinite history of past events to the universe. In light of this, the famous German mathematician David Hilbert, he said, the infinite is nowhere to be found in reality. It neither exists in nature nor provides a legitimate basis for rational thought. Also, the universe must be finite because modern cosmology concludes that the universe is not infinitely extendable into the past. It must have had a beginning. Now, according to modern cosmologists, the hot standard model of the Big Bang is where physical time and space were created and matter and energy were created at a point which the cosmologists call singularity. And clarifying this, John Boslow, the author of Stephen Hawking's universe, he states, it was not just matter that was created during the Big Bang, it was space and time that were created. So in a sense that time has a beginning, space also has a beginning. Now there are other models of the Big Bang such as the oscillating and the vacuum fluctuation models. These has arisen as a result of an assumption of an eternal universe. But modern cosmology has told us that there are principles within these models that necessitate a beginning to the universe. And some of these principles include the second law of thermodynamics, metastability, and eight causal fine tuning, something we could discuss if we get technical in the Q&A. Thus, the Big Bang model describes our universe as having a beginning a finite time ago. As Alexander Vilenkin, one of the world's leading theoretical cosmologists, says, with the proof now in place, cosmologists can no longer hide behind the possibility of a past eternal universe. There is no escape, people. He didn't say people, I said people. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning. Now in light of this, there are three possible explanations. Number one, the universe came out of nothing. Number two, the universe created itself. And number three, the universe has a cause. Now, we know the universe couldn't have come out of nothing because frankly, out of nothing, nothing comes. This is an undeniable philosophical principle. This is why the philosopher B.J. Swartz in his publication about time explains if there is anything we can find inconceivable is that something could arise from nothing. We also know the universe couldn't have created itself because that would imply a paradox. Just imagine your mother giving birth to herself. I know it's messy, but it's an impossibility. Also philosophically it would imply that the universe existed and didn't exist at the same time. Therefore, the best explanation is that the universe has a cause. Now, this doesn't mean it's God. It doesn't mean it's Buddha, Allah, and it doesn't mean it's Dan Barker, right? It doesn't mean anything. What it means is that there's a cause. But upon conceptual analysis, which basically means, let's think hard about this cause. Let's think critically, using our rational faculties. We will come to some striking conclusions. Now, since this cause created the universe, which includes time and space, I would argue it must be one. Because if we follow Occam's razor, which enjoins us not to posit causes beyond necessity, and tells that this cause must be one. Also, it must be uncaused due to the absurdity of infinite regress of causes, as we discussed with the American football example. Also, this cause must be immaterial, which follows the Quranic paradigm of Laysa kemithli hi There is nothing like the Creator. He is transcendent. Because since this cause created time and space, it must therefore transcend time and space, which really means transcend the material world. It must be powerful, because it created the whole universe. It must be intelligent, 
as he created all the laws in the universe and a lawgiver or lawmaker implies intelligence. Significantly, this cause must be able to have a relationship with the material world because it has a will. Now think about this. Since this cause is uncaused and therefore eternal, and it brought into existence a finite effect, it must have chosen the universe to come into existence, and a choice indicates a will, and a will indicates it can have a relationship with conscious beings within the universe. Now what we've done, just by reflecting upon reality, we've concluded what the Qur'an, which is the book of the Muslims, concluded 1400 years ago. As God says in the 112th chapter, say, He is God, the one, the only. God the eternal, the absolute, He begets not, nor is He begotten, and there is nothing like unto Him. Now before I get to my second argument, that the Qur'an is a miraculous discourse, I really want to basically have a new conversation with you guys today. I want us to be in an emotional, intellectual space where we can connect with each other. So I want to deal with some, what I would argue, outdated atheist cliches concerning this argument, so hopefully we can move along positively. And contention number one is quantum physics undermines this argument. Because there is a claim that particles come from nothing and that subatomic events do not correspond with causality. So things can begin to exist without the cause and things can come out of nothing. Well, firstly, the quantum vacuum is not nothing. It is something. It is a sea of fluctuating energy. It has a rich structure and obeys the laws of the universe. Like philosopher of science, John Polkinghorn, he states, it's not nothing. It's a structured and highly active entity. Also, there are deterministic perspectives adopted by physicists. For instance, the David Bohm interpretation being one of them. As Polkinghorn states, Bohm's theory, there are particles which are unproblematically objective and deterministic in their behavior. Contention number two. If the actual infinite is not real, then how can God be actually infinite? Well, listen to the argument. When we say the actual infinite is not real, we mean an actual infinite of discrete segments. The infinity of God is to be understood in terms of an undifferentiated infinite entity. Let me make this a bit more simple. The infinity of God is qualitative and not quantitative. It has nothing to do with an infinite set of definite and discrete finite particulars. Contention number three. Stephen Hawking, the renowned physicist in his new book, The Grand Design, has shown, apparently, that the universe can self-create. It can come from nothing. Well, he states in his book, because there is a law like gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. But first and foremost, if we read this book properly, his view of nothing doesn't mean nothing. It means the quantum vacuum. And we've already discussed that the quantum vacuum is something. It's a rich structure, it's a sea of fluctuating energy. Also, concerning the law of gravity, well, that's just a mathematical equation that describes nature. And it basically is the force of attraction between material objects. Now, if you're assuming that to be in place before the universe, but the universe has to be in place for gravity to be in place. So what Hawking is telling us, that the universe existed in order for it to bring itself into existence. But that's, again, like saying your mother gave birth to herself. It's a paradox. The final contention. The universe can't have a cause, because the universe is the beginning of time, and to claim such a thing, we return to to saying, what's north of the North Pole? Now, this firstly assumes that you need physical time for causality. This is not true. I would argue the claimant has to prove this. Take the Big Bang for example. The initial singularity of the Big Bang is not considered to be part of physical time, but constitutes a boundary to time. However, cosmologists say it's still causally connected to the universe. So what this shows is that even though physical time didn't exist at this point, there is a still a causal connection with the universe. So by analogy, God's act of creation can be the same. In other words, it's prior causally, but not prior in time. Now, let me go straight to the second argument, which is Islam makes sense of the miraculous nature of the Qur'an. Now, first and foremost, let's define some things here. What do we mean by miraculous, by miracle? Now, the word miracle comes from the Latin word miraculum, meaning something wonderful. Now, 
The old ironclad definition of miracles, the David Hume definition, if you like, was a violation of natural law. But I think this is incoherent because what's a natural law? A natural law is just an inductive generalization of patterns we perceive in the universe. Now, if something transcends the pattern or changes, it doesn't mean it's a miracle. Maybe we haven't been looking hard enough. And this is why the philosopher Belinsky observes, so as long as natural laws are conceived of as universal inductive generalizations, the notion of a violation of a natural law is incoherent. So I would pause an Islamic philosophical point here. Islamic thinking states that a miracle is an act of impossibility. Once we have, once we have exhausted all of the possible naturalistic explanations, then it's a signpost to the transcendent and signpost to the divine. And to substantiate this for the Quran, I would use two arguments, the unique literary form of the Quran and the way the Quran describes natural phenomena. Now, the Quran is a thinking book. It teaches us to think. For instance, it says, Afala taqilun. In Arabic meaning, do they not use their intellect? Do they not use their minds? But the Quran goes further than this and challenges mankind with regards to its authorship. And this challenge is with regards to its unique literary form. And this has a historical context because the Arabs at the time of Revelation 1400 years ago were the best at expressing themselves in the Arabic language. So they were Arabic linguists par excellence. But they failed to challenge the Quran. They couldn't imitate the unique literary form of the Quranic discourse. As Foster Fitzgerald Arbuthnot, who was a notable British orientalist and translator, states, and that though several attempts have been made to produce a work equal to it, as far as elegant writing co is concerned, none has yet succeeded. Now, the Quran's literary form descopes what we know of the Arabic language. Because the Arabic language can be divided into various literary forms. Rhyme prose, also known as saja, straightforward speech, also known as mursal, and poetry, which have to adhere to the 16 rhythmical patterns known as the Al-Bihar. Now we know the Quran is not rhyme prose because rhyme prose has certain definable features and the Quran transcends these features. As Devin J. Stewart, the famous Arabist, in his essay Rhyme Prose, which can be found in the Encyclopedia of the Quran, has shown that the structural features of Quranic Arabic differs from rhyme prose. We know the Quran is not straightforward speech because it has assonance, it has rhetoric, it has eloquence, and these are not the features of straightforward speech. We know the Quran is not poetry because none of the totality of each of the chapters of the Quran adhere to the rhythmical patterns of poetry. This is why Muhammad Khalifa, in his publication, The Authorship of the Quran, concludes, readers familiar with Arabic poetry realize that it has long been distinguished by its exact measures of syllabic sounds and rhymes. All of this is categorically different from the Quranic literary style. And it's no wonder the scholar and Arabist A.J. Arbery, he states, for the Quran is neither prose nor poetry, but a unique fusion of both. Now, how does this make the Quran a miracle? Well, the reason the Quran is a miracle here is because when we go to the nature of the event, which is the Quran, the nature of the event, which is the Arabic language, rather, and we exhaust all possibilities of the 28 finite letters, the finite grammatical rules, and the finite words, we cannot create the literary form of the Quranic discourse. And this shows that it's an act of impossibility. It is no wonder Professor Bruce Lawrence, in his book, The Quran, a biography, says, as tangible signs, Quranic verses are expressive of an inexhaustible truth. They signify meaning, laid within meaning, light upon light, miracle after miracle. Now my second argument to substantiate that the Quran is a signpost to the divine is its descriptions of natural phenomena. For example, the scholar Muhar Ali in his book, The Quran on Orientalists, he says the Quran is not contingent on a 7th century world view of natural phenomena. For instance, the Arabs at the time, they believed that the mountains used to keep the sky up. The Quran doesn't reflect none of this 7th century world view. And I'm going to use, for instance, a stage in the development of the human embryo as described in the Quran. Now the Quran mentions the word nutfa. Now according to the classical dictionaries, like Lisan al-Arab and the academic dictionaries like Lane's lexicon, this word can mean 
a singular entity which is part of a bigger group of its kind, a single sperm from a collection of millions of sperms. It can also refer to one female egg from a group of many other eggs in the ovaries, and it could also mean a drop of fluid. According to the prophetic traditions of the Prophet Muhammad, upon whom be peace, explained nutfa as a combination of fluids from the male and from the female, and they're both responsible for genetic material. Now, the Quran elsewhere describes the nutfa as a mingled entity from other entities. And think about this very carefully. All this multi laid meaning of one concise word is in line with modern embryology and physiology. For instance, embryologists John Allen and Beverly Kramer in 2010, they state the human individual arises from the conjugation of two minute structures called cells, one from the mother and one from the father. These are called gametes. Together, these gametes form a single cell, the zygote, from which the entire embryo, including its surrounding membranes, grows. Now, how do we explain this? Since the nature of embryological knowledge was based upon the works of Galen and Aristotle. And Galen and Aristotle, they had absurd views with regard to fertilization. Galen, for instance, said only the sperm has the faculties, meaning the sperm is responsible for the genetic material. We know this is false. Also, Aristotle had another absurd view. He said the sperm mixes with the menstrual blood. But the word for menstrual blood in Arabic is hey, It's not nutfa. So the Quran actually goes against a 7th century world view of, nat of describing natural phenomena. So where did he get this from? When we exhaust naturalistic explanations, he couldn't get it from Aristotle, he couldn't get it from Galen, he couldn't get it from Hippocrates, he couldn't get it from any of the medics at the time. Where did he get it from? This is an accumulative case to support that the Quran is from the divine. I would also like to add that this process also describes a physiological process. For instance, we know that these cell structures that form the zygote have to be contained in fluids. And we knew, as we just discussed, that the word nutfa actually also means fluid or a drop. Interestingly, sperm have to be contained in semen, and the ovum or the egg have to be contained in oviductal secretions. And this is recent findings in physiology that the oviductal secretions support the process of fertilization. So again, we ask the question, how is this in line with modern science? This book should be a reflection of a 7th century worldview, but it's not. And we could give many more examples during the Q&A. I really want to entertain a positive discussion with you guys, inshallah, which means God willing. Now, just to end, I have one more minute. I like to say that, look, this is not just about intellectual gymnastics. This is about who we are as human beings. Especially you Americans, right? Always claim about freedom and the pursuit of happiness and liberty. Very important concepts. But I want to raise something here. How do we achieve true freedom? An American writer once wrote that being born is like being kidnapped and then sold to slavery. And that's so true because we're just a reaction of a biological and social circumstance. You didn't choose where you were born. You didn't choose your parents. You didn't even choose your siblings. You didn't choose your DNA. You didn't choose the economic circumstances you were brought up in. You're shackled to these. So how do you attain true freedom? In Islamic spirituality, we say the way to free yourself from this social biological conditioning is actually to worship God. And by doing that, you free yourself from the slavery of your own desires and the slavery of the reaction to social biological processes. And hopefully we'll discuss this a little bit more in the Q&A and maybe transcend some of the intellectual gymnastics that I've been practicing so far. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Hans. Like every other Muslim I know, you're a very kind and very articulate person, and obviously also very educated. It's a real pleasure to know you. And thank you, Ian, for moderating. Thank you, Cash. Thank you, Building Blocks, uh, Chelsea, and uh, Jeff. Thanks for all your work on this. I used to believe in God. 
I was a minister of the gospel for 19 years. When I was a kid, raised in a Christian family, I thought, how lucky was I? I was born in the right family, in the right religion, in the right country, in the right time of history. I felt like I was on the front lines for Jesus, and it felt so real, and I believed in it. I got goosebumps when I used to pray, and I used to feel the presence of God in my mind, and thinking all the while goosebumps were evidence of the Holy Spirit, when actually goosebumps are evidence of evolution. Did you know that? Why do we get goosebumps? Because our hairier ancestors used to fluff up their fur when they were cold or when they had to scare off a predator. Muslims say there is no God but Allah. And I have to say that I agree with the first two-thirds of that sentence. <laughs> Atheism is the absence of a belief in God. Atheism is not a positive moral philosophy. It's not a positive philosophy at all. It is simply the absence of a belief. There is a subset of atheists who do take it a step further and claim they do believe there's no God. But basic atheism is simply not believing in a God. Since there's no evidence for a God, it is rational, therefore, not to believe in such a being. Since there is evidence that religions are natural human creations, it's not rational to insist in the absence of evidence that any particular religion, such as Islam, is a supernatural exception. During my rebuttal time, I will tell you exactly what's wrong with the arguments that Hamza gave. He's well-meaning and he's, he's articulate, but he's wrong. His arguments are stretches. But first, I want to make my own case here. What day of the week is it today? Thursday. What does Thursday mean? We have a day of the week devoted to a god named Thor. There were people all over the world, millions of people, good people, who were born into a religion of this sky god, thunder god named Thor, and they lived their lives worshiping this god, and they died worshiping that god. And that god was apparently influential enough that we have a day of the week, at least in many countries and many languages, named after that god. Who caused the thunder? Who caused the lightning? Who caused all those things to happen? Thor did, or Zeus did, or name your god. But now that we know more about weather, now that we know more about electricity, that gap is closed. That god is no longer necessary. That god is now just the name for a day of the week. Are, is there anybody in this room who worships the god Thor? Anybody? No? Anybody in this room worship the god Quetzalcoatl, the Mexican god? Anybody here? Millions of Mexicans, millions of Indians down there worship that god. No? Anybody here worship uh, or believe in the goddess Diana? The hunter, huntress goddess of Greek? No? Nobody here? Millions of people believe in that god. Um, any people in this room worship the god of Abraham, as described in the Bible or in the Quran? Any people in this room? Oh, there you go. We've got some. Well, the only difference between you and me, then, is that I just believe in one less God than you do. You are atheistic when it comes to other gods. You are skeptical when it comes to Thor. You are, you are probably a skeptic when it comes to uh, the angel Moroni. Uh, in fact, there's historical evidence for the angel Moroni and Joseph Smith, much more recent than, than Muhammad. And I would like to ask uh, Hamza if you believe in the existence of the angel Moroni. In fact, the Mormon church has some miracles. The Mormon religion has, how do you explain the existence of the Book of Mormon? It's unique literary style, you know, and where it came from. Of course, there are natural explanations for the origins of these writings. So, all of us in this room are skeptics. All of us in this room are doubters. Hamza is a skeptic and a doubter of the religious claims of others. Islam, in its basic meaning, is submission. You submit to the authority. But how can that be rational? When rationality and reason require the free exercise of your mind. You can't be a rational agent as you are required to submit to some dogma, to some doctrine, to some religion. It is not rational to start off by saying that we must submit. Submitting is wrong. Submitting is slavery. Yes, Hamza's right. 
that we all come prepackaged with genetic predispositions, and much of our nature, at least 50% of it, I think, is predetermined and we're stuck with it. But we have a frontal lobe. We do have the ability to transcend some of our nature. And this frontal lobe and the rational process that we all have rises above those instincts, rises above even the culture and the history of the religions that we were raised in. The reason I am an atheist is pretty simple. First of all, there's no evidence. If there were evidence, think about this. If there really were evidence, it would be on the table. It wouldn't be something as flimsy as the existence of the Quran uh, and supposed miracles of the way the Quran is worded. If there really were evidence for a God by now, somebody should have won the Nobel Prize for pointing that out. Think about it. If there really were evidence, anyone, any scientist, any skeptic, any doubter, anybody would bring it forth and say, here we go. We have positive evidence for a God. I'm also an atheist because there's not even a coherent definition of a God. What is this God made of? How can a spiritual being exist? Um, sometimes the definitions that are given, I've debated other Muslim scholars, um, one of them said, God, Allah, is infinitely merciful. I think most Muslims believe that. God is, in fact, isn't that in the very beginning? God is all merciful, ever merciful. And he said, but God is also infinitely just. He is all just. Well, that's impossible. If you have a God that's defined as infinitely merciful and infinitely just, if that's your definition, that God does not exist because it cannot exist. What is mercy? Mercy is distributing punishment with a less degree of severity than is deserved. Mercy means that you let, you let someone off with less punishment. What is justice? Justice means that people get punished with what they deserve. That's what justice is. You don't send a kid to jail for stealing cookies, right? You, you have a certain sentencing and punishment for a crime. So if Allah is infinitely merciful, think about this. If he's infinitely merciful, all merciful, ever merciful, then there's no need for hell. I can't go to hell if Allah is infinitely merciful, right? Because infinite mercy means no matter what the crime is, even, dis even disobeying Allah, even refusing to submit to Allah, is one of those things that would be covered by infinite mercy. Therefore, it is a contradiction in Islam to claim that Allah is infinitely and ever merciful, and yet there's still a hell to punish those of us who somehow escape that mercy. If God is infinitely just, then He can't be merciful. So if that's your definition of a God, that God cannot exist logically, rationally. Of course, different theologians and different religions have different definitions of a God, and they tinker with them. Even within Christianity, they have to tinker with omnipotence, omnipresence, omniscience, to make, and, and with the problem of evil, to try to make this God palatable. To, and, but if God is defined in mutually contradictory ways, then we, we can say, not only is there no evidence for such a God, be like arguing for the existence of a married bachelor. Can a married bachelor exist? No, it self-contradicts. So I have yet to see a coherent definition of Allah or Jehovah uh, or a spiritual being that makes any sense to know what we're even talking about. And of course there's no good arguments for God. This uh, first cause argument that Hansa gave, I will, I will talk about that during rebuttal time is not a good argument. It's basically a God of the gaps argument, but it's even itself internally contradictory. Uh, there are other arguments that people have brought forth, ontological, uh, design, teleological arguments, and all of them, as Bertrand Russell once said, uh, they all boil down to bad grammar. The arguments for God just don't hold water. If you look at them, if you scratch beneath the surface and look at them and, and unpack the words, uh, they fall apart logically. And there's no agreement. And, you know, if, if Muslims could agree with each other, and they don't. I've even uh, heard Hamza say that uh, there are different uh, uh, interpretations of the Quran, and different scholars differ on this. Well, if the Quran is such a perfect book, why are there differing interpretations? Why are there disagreements? Why are there factions? And within Christianity, why are all these different groups arguing over the same so-called Holy Scripture? I used to preach the Bible was inspired. But Paul wrote in the Bible, God is not the author of confusion. But can you think of a single book that's caused more confusion than the Bible? And, and look at the Quran. There's no agreement among believers about many of these principles. Of course, in general, there is some agreement. 
But uh, if I were a god and I wrote a book that was so sloppy and so open to misinterpretation, I'd be, I'd be embarrassed to release it to the public. <laughs> and of course, there's no good answer to the problem of evil. If God is, if Allah and God is all merciful and all caring and all good, all you have to do is walk into any children's hospital and you know there is no God. Parents who are desperately praying for this miracle, the Hamsa believes that miracles can happen because they're impossible, and yet these children die at the same rate as anyone else. If prayer were really answered, if, if faith in Allah really made a difference, we would see it, we would measure it. It does not make any difference. A belief in Allah makes no difference except in how much money you might give or how much... Um, if, if you are weak enough in your moral principles that you need a religion to motivate you to be kind and to help the poor, well then maybe in that case, keep your religion. We'd rather have you good to the poor than not. But millions and millions of good non-believers in this world are charitable, they give to the board, they give to charity, they help people out without using religion as an excuse. And of course, uh, that's the final point, there's no need for a God. Millions of people live their lives with purpose and meaning, with joy, with love, without having to bow down. As, as Paul said in the Bible, he was a slave of Christ, and of course as the Quran says, we are all submission, we are all having to submit to the will and the authority of this, this person who created us. We've sometimes heard it said that the absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence. I don't think that's true. I think the absence of evidence is, it's not proof of absence, but the absence of evidence is indeed evidence of absence. In fact, you can hold it in your hand. For example, suppose there were a bomb scare, and we all had to leave this building, and the authorities came in, and we were all standing outside waiting, and the authorities went through the whole building, and then they finally announced, okay, it's clean, you can come back in. Would you come back in? Would you have proof that there's no bomb? Probably they would go through the building, they would probably make a checklist or a chart or something, and they would look in all the trash cans and all the drawers, and then well, whatever they do, they would do, they would certify the building is clean, right? Would you have proof of, of absence? No, but you would have evidence of absence. That chart you could hold in your hand would be evidence of absence. The same thing happens when, when we look for a God. When, if, if a God existed, the universe should be different in some way. Some, there would be some way that we would note it, but as we look through the universe, as we go through the trash cans and the drawers and we look everywhere, we, we see a universe that looks as if there is no God. We actually do have evidence of absence. In fact, Victor Stanger, the uh, physicist in his book, God the Failed Hypothesis, says, if God is a hypothesis that's carefully defined, then it fails. The existence of God fails all tests. One of the reasons, and there are many reasons why Islam is not rational, and one of them is that the Quran is based on hearsay. We have hearsay testimony, which would not stand up in a court of law, that a man named Muhammad went into a cave and he got some words to recite. Recite. The word Quran means to recite. Um, in fact, the, I think the very first recitation, if I correct me if I'm wrong, Hamza, that, uh, historically was that uh, God created humans from a blood clot. That's the word that I have in one of my translations. Other translations say other things. And by the way, different translations of the Quran contradict each other. And I have two different versions, and sometimes the same verse is translated different ways in the English. Uh, Arabic is not that strange of a language. Arabic is a language like any other. Uh, all languages have problems with translations, but Arabic is not that special. It's a, it's a wonderful language. It's, it's unique, but all languages are unique. When you translate from Spanish or when you translate from Greek, when you translate from Arabic, you're going to have some problems. But uh, if there is an all-knowing, all-caring God who cares about this message getting to us, then why wouldn't he make it so that the translations would be understandable to all of us? Uh, what we do know about the Quran is that it was written by human beings. And what we do know from history is that human beings make mistakes. Whoever put that book together was a human being. Uh, was it Abu Bakr who gave the canon, the original canon for the, um, for the Quran? Which is just a guy. Why do we take his word? Why do we think his word is special? He's just a guy, just like the people who wrote the New Testament. 
they had a religious agenda, and everyone claims the New Testament has these irreproducible miracles too. The Book of Mormon has these miracles, and look at all those things. They're just people. They're just human beings. It's, I, I think Hans agrees with, with me that someone like Joseph Smith, although he claims to be inspired, he claimed to have found in this hole in the ground these golden tablets, uh, he was just a human being who exaggerated. He made mistakes. He was wrong. He misinterpreted. The people who put the Quran together were human beings. Human beings make mistakes. They made a mistake with the Quran. The Quran has verses that are contradictory within it. It can't be a perfect book if it has verses that contradict each other. One example, uh, there is a uh, surah and, that says that uh, hell is eternal. Hell lasts forever. But I read another surah, if I can find it, uh, if you want me to look it up for you. It says, no, hell doesn't last forever. It lasts as long as the earth lasts. So there's a contradiction. A, a, a perfect being who's writing a perfect book would not have put verses in there which contradict each other. And that's just one example. Now, if I were an Islamic scholar, I would say, well, I can interpret and reinterpret. But then there's the problem. Why does it have to be interpreted and reinterpreted? Why can't it just be clear? The Quran is not clear, just like the Bible is not clear. And I think one of the main reasons that the Quran is not a rational book is that instead of using reason and argument to make its point, the Quran uses a threat of violence. Hell as a threat of violence. Stephen Prothero, who was reading through the Quran, says, this is, a, this is not amazing literature. This is not special literature. He said, the Quran reads like a fire and brimstone sermon from start to finish. Let me give you some examples. We have prepared for unbelievers a shameful punishment. I'm the unbeliever, okay? This is talking about me. You Muslims who think this is a wonderful book, it's talking about me. I'm a non-believer. Those who disbelieve our revelation shall be cast into hell. And when their skin is burnt up and singed, we shall give them a new coat that they may go on tasting the agony of punishment. For God is almighty and all wise. So the believers will laugh at the infidels on that day, regarding them from their cushioned seats. So you're going to sit on a cushioned purple couch underneath the fig tree with these dewy-eyed young women sitting next to you, and you're going to be laughing at me for having the temerity to think my own thoughts and disagree with you. I'm an infidel. I'm a non-believer. Your book is arguing from a threat of violence to me. And that's what the Quran is. Believe or burn. Believe or burn. If you don't believe, you're going to suffer. Any system of thought that has to make its point with a threat of violence is morally bankrupt. And if you hold that book under your arm with any pride, you should be ashamed of yourself. You should be able to make your point using pure reason and not, not touting a book that has a threat that my skin's going to be burned off my arms and I'm going to, it's going to be regrown so that Allah can burn it again and again while you're sitting up there laughing. Are you proud of that? You think that is rational? You think that is kind? You think that is good? If you do think so, and if your God does exist, and if He did create a hell, then I would say to Allah, you created hell, you go to hell. You're not worthy of my respect. In fact, I will never submit to a being who is so irrational that he has to make his points with a threat of violence. And I think you're better than that. I think you're kinder than that. I think you've risen above the brutality of your own book, in spite of the primitiveness of the book that you believe in, to be a good person. And I salute you for that. I applaud you for being a good person, in spite of Islam. So during my rebuttal time, I'm going to quit now. I think there's one minute left. Uh, I will explain uh, what is wrong with his first cause arguments. Thank you. All right, thanks for the opening statements. Uh, we're going to go straight to the rebuttals, eight minute rebuttals, uh, beginning with Dan. Yeah, just look at these over real fast. Okay, there are three big problems with Hamza's arguments about the, sometimes it's called the Kalam cosmological argument, and even Christian theologians use it too. And, and 
Hamza already alluded to a couple of the problems, although, although his defense against them were not good. First of all, this argument begs the question. Because it makes an assumption. The universe began to exist. And so things that have a beginning have a cause. Is basically what he's saying. Anything that has a beginning has a cause. Uh, why does that beg the question? Because the existence of a beginningless thing or personality is the very conclusion you are arguing for in your argument. Allah is a beginningless thing. But you are assuming your very initial premise that the universe can be divided up into two different sets. A set of things that begin to exist and a set of things that don't begin to exist. And yet you offer only one possibility to, to fill the definition of things that don't begin to ex exist, which is God, which is Allah. If Allah is the only thing, or if a creative being, internal transcendent being, is the only thing that fits that bill, then you have effectively begged the question uh, by saying everything that begins to exist translates to everything except God. So your first premise is saying everything except God needs a cause, which begs the question. It's circular reasoning. You're bringing your conclusion into your premise. You can't do that logically. You can get out of that. There are ways for you to avoid begging the question by either defining conceptually or potentially some kind of an item other than God that does not begin to exist, in which case your, your phrase would be meaningful, it would be coherent. If we all understood, and we, none of us have an experience of anything that doesn't begin to exist, how could we? In the universe we live in, we can't point to anything that doesn't begin to exist in time because we live in a temporal universe. So right there from the start, you are kind of secretly packaging your conclusion into your premise by assuming the very thing you're trying to prove. You've already pointed out that the argument is self-refuting, uh, although you think you had a response to it. When you say that an actual infinity cannot exist in reality, or who did you quote saying, the infinite is nowhere to be found in reality, but you say that God is some kind of a different kind of infinity. He's not a discrete infinity. But let me ask you this. The person who's going to make the football pass has to get permission from the coach, who has to get permission from somebody. If there is a God, if Allah exists, and Allah somehow, either in or out of time, let's assume that it makes sense to talk about causality outside of time. I don't think it does, but let's just assume that it does. Uh, because how do you know what, if without temporal antecedents, how do you know what came first? That's how we know how causality works, is because of time. We don't, uh, we don't look at an effect and then think the cause happened later. That's how we know what the very word causality means. But let's just assume that in some strange way, because of our limited minds, there is this being up there outside of time who can function in a causal way. Uh, before Allah created the universe, in your interpretation, He must have had some thoughts. He must have decided for some reason, ah, I either I'm lonely or my justice or my holy, or whatever His reason, He must have had some thoughts for it before or, if you don't like a temporal word, antecedent to the decision to create it. There must have been a thought in the mind of this be deep being, antecedent, and then let me use the word before, even though that's a temporal word, because in cause and effect we can talk about logic, one thing follows another, whether inside of time or out. And so, before or antecedent to that thought, Allah must have had a preceding thought, and before or antecedent to that thought, Allah must have had a preceding thought. And according to you, these are, these are thoughts in the mind of a being. According to you, there cannot exist an infinite regression uh, into a timeless uh, uh, non-beginning in, in, in reality. Therefore, in the mind of Allah, there must have been a first thought. If an actual infinity cannot exist in reality, we're not talking about discreteness, we're not talking about numbers, we're not talking about where does the set of negative numbers begin. Uh, and even you are correct to point out that we can't find that within reality. If we can't find that within reality, then neither can we find that within the mind of a god. A god would be subject to the same limitations that you think the universe is subject to. If the universe cannot come from nothing, then neither can God come from nothing. If God exists, if Allah exists, He is a thing. He's something, right? He's not nothing. If nothing comes from nothing, then... Allah comes, can't come from nothing. Allah had to have a creator as well. 
And if you posit, therefore, the existence of a being or an entity that is eternal, then how can you fault scientists for hypothesizing that the universe itself is eternal, uh, could be eternal? Uh, another, what did I do before? When you're talking on the clock, you know, your mouth doesn't uh, lubricate like normal. So. Um, I won't say a name, but I'll say it. Thank Jeff for the, for the one. <laughs> we should give thanks where thanks is due, not to some imaginary being. No. But uh, another problem with this argument is that uh, it's comparing apples and oranges. And I'm surprised that Hamza doesn't see this. Um, the word universe these days refers to our particular universe that we're in now. Uh, cosmologists don't use the word universe anymore. In fact, I don't think any cosmologists think it was a singularity anymore. You're, you're reading science books from 20 years ago, I think. Uh, Hawking's has given up on the word singularity. No one thinks the Big Bang started with a singularity. Now, of course, uh, most people think that we're at that minimum, that Planck uh, distance or whatever they call it, the Planck constant minimum. And in Dick Stinger's books, uh, he talks about the possibility of a biverse where time flows. And, but that point was really a point where time is flowing in opposite directions. But in any event, the confusion you're making here is you're confusing logical spheres. When Bertrand Russell was debating cobblestone back in the 40s, uh, asking about the word universe, Bertrand Russell said, well, the word universe, today he would use the word cosmos because of the possibility of multiple universes. In fact, Hawking and, and even Paul Davies now are all on board with the high likelihood of there being a multiverse, in which case our particular universe that did begin with the Big Bang is just one of many. It's not the cosmos. So the problem you're making is that, uh, the, the, uh, the mistake you're making, Hamza, is to confuse the word universe with cosmos. So yes, our particular universe did have a beginning uh, in space and time, space-time. And like you say, it can be like a point of the North Pole. What's north of the North Pole? Well, the North Pole is just a point like any other. So it wasn't like, a, uh, like a, there was the beginning of time where the clock started ticking. Uh, so you're comparing apples and oranges. Even if our particular universe did have a beginning, it doesn't, that beginning doesn't apply to the cosmos itself. You, what you're doing is you're trying to jump up a logical sphere. And what Bertrand Russell said to Copplestone, it would be like saying, well, since every human being had a mother, therefore the human race had a mother. That doesn't follow when you jump up from apples to oranges. And that's the logical mistake you're making by confusing and conflating logical spheres. So your arguments don't work, your evidence doesn't work, and during a further rebuttal, let's talk a little more about the Quran. Okay, thank you very much. I thought that was a very interesting emotional sermon towards the end. I almost felt like crying. I was feeling sorry for Dan Barker. I thought you were just about to cry. I was going to come and give you a big hug, you know? I you, were, you were so upset about your outdated cliches about religion, about the concept of hell. I mean, it's quite interesting that you... It's just like typical atheists, not to be... Uh, stereotypical of course, is that we fail to read about people. We fail to really co want to connect with other human beings. When was the last time have we read an exegesis of the Quran, for example? When was the last time that we read what is Islamic law in the eyes of a Muslim? Do we do that? Or do we go straight to the shelf and say, what does Robert Spencer have to say? The guy who hates Islam. What does that say about our intentions? Do we have an emotional intellectual atmosphere where we are listening with the intent to understand or are we manufacturing a response? Something to think about. Okay, let's talk about Dan Barker's claims. First and foremost, you talk about God of the gaps. It's not God of the gaps. We don't say we don't know, then we just squeeze God in there. We actually reflect upon reality, the universe, we come to certain conclusions, we come to certain attributes, and then we see that there's a correlation between our view and what reality has told us. That's not God of the gaps at all. God of the gaps would be, uh, I don't know, therefore God did it. So I think that's an outdated atheist cliche. Also, you're saying 
submission to God is not rational. Well, you said this about grammar. Let's change the definition here. Well, you could submit to yourself, submit to social conditioning, or submit to a higher rational being. What sounds more rational, people? To submit to a higher rational being. If you know that rational being exists and you have evidence for that. So you could play with words and we could, be, we could preach. I mean, I think your preachiness has carried with yourself in your atheistic age. And I think, you know, we can't have a cake and eat it. I don't like Christianity, but I'm going to stay a preacher. Thank you. No worries, dude. <laughs> anyway, so the point is about the God's names and attributes. We don't say, we don't say all or infinite. What we say is God is the merciful. And Islamic theology says that we reconcile his names and attributes. The the in the loving or the merciful means he's greater than human beings. And then when we look at all his names and attributes, we see them via his oneness and we reconcile them together. We don't say he's infinitely this, infinitely that, infinitely this. No, Islamic theology says he's the merciful, the just, and we take these names and attributes and we reconcile them together, for instance. Also, you talk about difference of opinion. Well, that's going to happen when you have human agency anyway. You have that with anything. And we consider difference of opinion in the Islamic tradition as a mercy. Imagine everyone being the same. Imagine everyone looking the same and acting the same. I mean, what's with that? That's like, that's boring, right? Yeah? We're not boring people, Muslims, you know? <laughs> um, also, <laughs> you talked about the Quran just based on hearsay and testimony. I mean, surely, I don't believe you said that. I was so upset, I thought you were a clever guy. I mean, I mean when we look at the science of textual integrity of the Qur'an, we see that the, sign, the historical scientific principles applied to the textual integrity of the Qur'an surpass any known Western type of history. For example, we have a philosophy of the mutton, which is the text itself, and the isnad, which is a chain of narration. And each person in the chain of narration has a biography. Was he trustworthy? Did they meet each other? So the sciences of textual authority in the Qur'an are, are extremely, extremely sound. But significantly, what I'd like to add is, the main part of the preservation of the Qur'an is based on oral tradition. An oral tradition. And it's not just Chinese whispers, because it's based upon something in Arabic called mutawatir reporting, which is recurrent testimony. Now, recurrent testimony, as C.A. Cody in his book Testimony says, many things that we believe in is because of testimony. You probably believe China exists, because of testimony. Many of us have never been to China before, but yet we believe China exists. Now, with regards to the Quran, it's based on recurrent reporting that has been reported by so many different people at different times and places, all going back to the Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace. To claim that that's not the Quran is to claim a conspiracy, that they had a time machine and conspired together to say this is what the Quran is going to be. Um, also, you talked about the contradiction, please find it for me, I've never heard of that before, that sounds like it came from left field. Um, also, the threat of violence, for example. I mean, come on, this is so shallow. What we're saying is, a disbeliever is someone who has been given evidence and out of his arrogance rejects it, out of his arrogance. Like kufur, the disbeliever means someone who has a veil over the heart, they cover. Like, you know the farmer who puts a seed in the soil and he covers the seed? Like, you're covering the truth. This is what we mean. We don't believe someone like a red Indian who's never heard about Islam. We don't say that person is going to hell. We don't have this type of theology. That's a straw man. He's built a logical fallacy. He's built a straw man of Islam. I suggest you need to start reading around the intricacies of Islamic theology. Also, you have to understand the Quran is a thinking book. For example, the things I've talked about are based in the Quran. As the Quran says, do you not use your minds? Do they not reflect within themselves? And in themselves, do they not see? Are you going to base your life on your forefathers? Even if it's based on no knowledge? These are rational principles. It's an existential text that makes you think about the meaning of existence and who you are. You're being quite unfair, Dan, you know? Come on, let's be fair, man. Um, also, you talked about Singularity. You know, singularity is not old. Vilenkin, 2008. Cosmologists in 2006. Even recently, cosmologists are understanding the concept of singularity. It's not old stuff. I mean, you could talk about Stephen Hawking all you like, but it doesn't mean he's right just because he's Stephen Hawking. I mean, that's an argument of authority, right? You're standing on the shoulders of giants. 
Um, also, you talk to also about that why isn't everyone a Muslim? Why isn't, why isn't the evidence on the table? That's again a logical fallacy. You're standing on the soldiers of giants. Because people don't do it. It's like a, the fallacy of social reasoning. Like, just because the majority of people don't believe in it, therefore, I shouldn't believe in it. I mean, is that critical thinking? I mean, that's like Nazi Germany to me. Everyone wants to kill a Jew, maybe I should kill a Jew too. Yeah? I mean, come on, is that, is that right behavior? Damn, surely not. Um, also, you spoke about uh, apples and oranges. Again, you have a grammar problem. No, I see the universe as an object because it has a spatial temporal boundary. I'm not saying it's a category of things. So I don't think your argument here works. And also, you think that we have a special pleading to God with this argument. But since the atheist has always maintained the same about the universe, it's beginning as an uncaused, then you do the same thing. I mean, interestingly, Professor Anthony Flew said that we need to make a choice. Either the universe is uncaused, or the cause of the universe is uncaused. Now, I think in light of tonight's evidence, we know that the universe is caused, and the cause of the universe is uncaused. Also, you talked about well, then who caused God. Well, the thing is, God never came into being. Rather, we know we have evidence the universe came into being. And finally, you spoke about God's thoughts, but we say, that that's a fallacy, it's a straw man argument with regards to who God is. We say that his intentions, if you want to put them even to that kind of words, are eternal. And there's a difference here. There's not like a discrete, finite kind of process going on that you could claim that the actual infinity doesn't make sense with regards to God itself, which I discussed in the initial part of my presentation. But more of that in the next part of the rebuttals. Thank you. One more round of rebuttals and then the closing statements. This round of rebuttals are uh, five minutes each. Get the with them. So, did Allah create the universe and say, Oh, look, I created the universe. Now I better decide to create the universe. Did it happen that way? Doesn't deciding come before or antecedent to action? In the mind of a deity, in the mind of Allah, a decision precedes an action. Therefore, in the mind of Allah, there, there, according to you, there's an infinite series of preceding decisions. I do read the Quran for myself. I didn't consult a lot of these uh, authorities who, if, in fact, if you do consult authorities, they disagree with each other a lot. And you all know that within Islam, there's arguments, there's disagreements, and that's wonderful. But that strikes against the uniformity of the teaching of this book. I read the Quran for myself. I've read two different English translations myself, with my own mind, with my open mind and an open heart, and I reject it on rational grounds. It is irrational, it is insulting, we can do better. Uh, read Shakespeare. Shakespeare can't be reproduced by anybody. Read, read Moby Dick. Read some other wonderful works of literature. The Quran is amazing, but it's so repetitive. Have, have many of you read it? It's so repetitive over and over and hell and hell and believers and this and it's, it's uh, obviously it's not poetry because who would ever have set that to music? Uh, but um, let, me, let me read to you here. Here's four, surah number 493. Anyone who kills a believer intentionally will be cast into hell to abide there forever and suffer God's anger and damnation. Forever. Hell is forever. But, Surah 11. And I didn't get this from a book. I just got this from reading myself. And those who are doomed will be in hell, for them will be sighing and sobbing, where they will dwell so long as heaven and earth endure. So, the punishment in one Surah says, they suffer in a hell forever. The verse in another surah, which you're asking me to read with an open mind, contradicts this surah. Uh, when I was a Christian apologist, I would have been real good at finding some rationalization. But the plain words of the text here show me that this book is contradictory. So uh, please don't accuse me of, of special pleading or of looking up somebody else's. This is from my own reading. The Quran does not surpass science. Why didn't Muhammad tell us, or why didn't Allah tell Muhammad something about, why didn't he say, by the way, folks, wash your hands before you eat. Why didn't he tell us about the germ theory of disease or something? Why didn't he come up with these basic kind of rough ideas? And even in the Bible, you can find supposed answers to prophecy that if you interpret them a certain way, more or less 
comport with what we think we know about cosmology or about science today, but there's so much more useful that the Quran could have said to us, that Allah could have said to us, which would have been much more important than bow down and submit and make sure you're pointing in the right direction because the direction is important. And by the way, that makes Islam a kind of flat earth idea. Why is it important to, to point to Mecca? By the way, Mecca is not that way. Mecca is actually kind of this way. And yet people, you know, the Mirabs, is that what it's called? They seem to be pointing out into outer space somewhere, if you think about it. It's a flat earth mentality. And I know you think a lot in the Quran and a lot of Islam is metaphorical. But then why can't we also think, therefore, that God himself is metaphorical? If there is metaphor with hell and heaven and language use, then why can't we think that Allah himself is also a metaphor that Muhammad came up with? You, you say that the uh, authority of the Quran is based on testimony that has a link. We don't know that. You're taking somebody's word for that. Uh, nobody was there in the cave with Muhammad. He came out and told us what he said. Nobody was there to hear it except Muhammad. So we're taking Muhammad's word, just like you would take Joseph Smith's word that he saw the angel Moroni, whom I'm sure you doubt exists. I doubt that Muhammad actually heard a voice unless he was schizophrenic in some way, which happens with a lot of religious leaders. I doubt that that actually happened. Uh, yes, conspiracies happen. All religions are, are a conspiracy in some way or another. The people are conspiring to put their best face on it. The origin of the Quran is not that special. And by the way, uh, you are wrong to say that the universe is an object. If you're talking about our particular uh, uh, you know, uh, event horizon of the universe we live in right now, this universe, yes, it had a beginning, it has a, an unbounded infinity to it. But the word universe, as you're using it, means cosmos. Cosmos is the collection of set of all things. The cosmos is all things that exist. Therefore, the cosmos cannot be a thing. The cosmos is a set of things. So you're comparing apples and oranges. Your logic is, is irrational. Okay, this is very good. Um, let's go to the Shakespeare question. Shakespeare is inimitable. O oh, Romeo, Romeo, wherefore thou art thou a Romeo? Deny thy father, deny thy name. Or we can make it more Islamic. O oh, Abdullah, O oh, Abdullah, deny thy mother, <laughs> deny thy tribe. You know, we can make it that. But the point is, see, see, I want you to connect with me. I know you don't know what I'm talking about because you have no idea of the Arabic language. You have no idea about the intricacies of eloquence and the sciences of Arabic. So I think the most sincere thing for you to do is say, Hamza, I don't know, man. Let's discuss this like two gentlemen who don't want to beat each other about it. I want to know what does this argument mean. Maybe it might be a valid argument. Throwing the Shakespeare one is so shallow because Shakespeare, or Sheikh Zabur, <laughs> essentially, Shakespeare, for example, his, his, he articulated some of his plays in the iambic pentameter. Who studies English literature here? Iambic pentameter has been replicated by many people. And as a matter of fact, his contemporary Christopher Marlowe has been accused of some of his works. So the Shakespeare argument is not an argument. Also, the contradiction, I didn't really get the verses, we do that in the Q&A, someone bring the question up please. Also, the funny thing is about washing your hands. Why didn't the Quran tell us to wash your hands? The Quran does teach you to wash your hands before every prayer, dude. And not just that, the, and he said before eating. You know the Prophet Muhammad, his sunnah, his way? Do you know what he did before he ate? Yes sir, he washed his hands. <laughs> big deal people and um, also testimony see the problem is do I know that the prophet peace and blessings on him saw the angel the reason I know that is not based on testimony the reason I know that is because he claimed it and I know he was truthful because of historical evidence and I know the Quran that he brought forth is a sign post to the transcendent also if you want testimony there are African tribes today who have never read an Arabic Quran but they learn it from memory via an oral tradition all the way 1400 centuries back to the Prophet himself. To claim, to claim that the Quran is not intact would be to claim a conspiracy which you're doing. Also, um, I disagree, I think you're just building a straw man of my argument, apples and oranges, that's not true. I'm considering the universe as a spatial temporal boundary as an object. I mean, you could argue about this till the cows come home. Um, also, you talked about flat earth, right? Well, this is not true because even the Quran itself mentions explicitly about basically the, the night and the day and use the word taqweer. Basically, if you go to Arabic language, it's like putting a turban on, you know, a round head. Yeah, so it indicates the opposite of a flat earth type of 
perspective. What else did you say? We didn't say much. I mean, you'd be angry. You're angry at God, aren't you? Dan? <laughs> you sound angry at God, to be honest. I Is this therapy for you? I mean, come on, man. It sounds like it's therapy for you, man. I mean, I study psychology. Cognitive behavioral therapy is cheap and it works. Thank you. All right, uh, seven minutes of closing statements, beginning with that. could not go into in much depth, but Hamza is completely missing this logical sphere of being, completely missing the point. Cosmologists today admit that this universe that we live in, and decades ago nobody would even use the phrase this universe. In Bertrand Russell's day, the word universe meant all of existence, everything. Today, the word universe doesn't mean all of existence, everything. Today, the word we use is the word cosmos for all of existence and everything. The word universe today is a much smaller word. In fact, we talk about multiple universes. This universe, this particular event horizon that has this particular Big Bang within it. So you are absolutely right that this universe had a beginning. You're absolutely right that we can go back to a point at the Big Bang. Yes, this universe. But that's not the cosmos. You are taking observations from within this universe and then jumping out of that logical sphere to the bigger sphere of the cosmos, which, as I pointed out earlier, many are very happy uh, about the, the possibility of a multiverse, or even without a multiverse. Uh, um, explanations for the origin of this particular universe. That's why you are comparing apples and oranges. You can't take, suppose I were to say, uh, use a bad, a bad argument, that uh, every nation began with a war. Um, the alliance of all nations began 20 years ago. Therefore, there was a war 20 years ago. Does that, is that logical? No. Why? Because I'm confusing uh, a set with the items within the set. Suppose I said, uh, every musician in an orchestra plays in harmony with itself. Therefore, it follows that every orchestra is playing in harmony with every other orchestra. That doesn't follow. You've jumped up a logical sphere and you're confusing. You're taking a finding from one level and trying to apply it to a higher level. That's the mistake you're making logically, and I'm surprised you don't see that. You've read books. You've studied these things, Hamza. Um, it's comparing, and even Bertrand Russell in the 40s pointed that out about the human race not having a mother. Okay, so we are all human beings. Right? We're all biological animals. Any of us can breed with each other. We all come back, we all come from a common ancestor somewhere back there. We all have common needs and wants. Uh, I'm not ashamed of being a preacher. I think being a preacher is fine. And actually is kind of good therapy, yes. And I'm not ashamed of being angry sometimes. Sometimes, especially against, not against a God who doesn't exist, but against followers of His who insist on threatening people like me with a, a physical torment, which is what your book does. There's no doubt about it. Anybody reading the Quran in any language can see that there is a threat of physical violence in that book. How are you going to talk your way out of that? It's there. It's plain. And I think all of you Muslims in the room agree. In fact, I debated a Muslim in uh, Colorado uh, last year. And when I mentioned that, you're going to be sitting on the couch under the fig tree with the young virgins looking down at me and laughing while the skin's burning off. And he put his thumbs up and he smiled. Yes, yes. He was happy about that. And by the way, there are Islamic scholars who do say, and I, I, I can give you tapes of it, that Allah is infinitely merciful. They use that phrase. Um, uh, one that I debated in Queens uh, said, Allah is infinitely merciful. He is ever merciful. He is all merciful. And He is infinitely just. So there's a, maybe you don't use those phrases, but some do. And my point was that if 
You define God that way. That you can show that that God is a married bachelor and, and does not exist. You might have a different definition, but I've never heard a coherent definition of what this God is. If God is made out of a spirit, how do you, how do you distinguish a spirit from nothing? Like, like the philosopher Delos McCown said, the invisible and the non-existent look very much alike. Um, how do you know what a spirit is? Uh, we know things exist by how much space they take up. Things that exist can be measured. If they can't be measured, they don't exist. If they can't be limited in some way, uh, you know, along dimensions or how much time they, they, they take up, or weighed or measured, then they don't exist. And since I've never seen a definition of this Allah or God that in any way can be defined coherently or logically or measured in any way, we, we cannot say that that being does exist. It exists only as a concept in your mind and in the mind of Muhammad and in the mind of people all over the world. They have this idea of this being that exists. But we are all human beings with basic generals of human nature, and we all have the same needs and wants. What difference does it make? Why, is it, why do you think it's more rational for you to use this religious belief of yours to live a life of meaning and purpose when millions of good people don't believe in your God and yet live lives that are just as good, if not better, than yours? What's the point? If the point is submission to avoid an eternal punishment, then that is despicable. If the point is to live a good life, then I applaud that. In fact, I think in the Quran, from my reading, there's more emphasis on good works and helping the poor within Islam than there is within the Christian New Testament. And I think that's one of the positives about Islam that we can, we can say. Most Muslims really are concerned about helping, directly helping the poor. But think about this. Picture this equation, all right? And let's see if you can solve it. Religion plus good works equals good works. Now solve for religion. <laughs> What's the point? Why? Why spend all your time bowing down in prayer? Why spend all your time doing these rituals? If you separate the good from all the religions, Islam has a lot of good in it. So does Christianity. So does Judaism. All religions have good in it. The good is not a religious idea. It's a humanistic idea. The good is peace, avoiding harm, minimizing harm, increasing well-being, or whatever you want to call it. The good is the human needs and wants that we all share together. The things that are distinguish a religion from the common, transcendent good that all of us human beings have, those things are not good things. What day of the week you should worship, what kind of clothes women should wear, what kind of recitations you should make, those are a waste of time. It's more rational to spend your time and your energy doing actual good rather than investing in a divisive, irrational religion. Okay, good. Thank you very much for your patience, brothers and friends. Okay, first and foremost, see, what's interesting in the last 10 years in the sociology, sociology of religion, there's been academic studies, longitudinal studies as well, that have shown that religion actually has a positive correlation to well-being in contrast to the atheist worldview. I mean, if we were to reduce it on maybe Dan Barker's disposition today and mine, you may be able to understand that as well. It's a bit angry today. Anyway, so according to the sociology of religion, it has shown that religious people have better mental health, better physical health, lower criminality, higher levels of happiness, and higher levels of altruism and philanthropic activity. This academic results, not just I'm just feeling this, right? Example number one, in 2000, Schnittke, in the Journal for the Scientific Study of Religion, examined a data set of nearly 3,000 adults from the general population, and he found religious involvement had no significant relation with depression, and he found that religiousness was a buffer against mental distress. Also, in the Handbook of Religion and Health, 
edited by Howard Koenig and others, the authors reviewed 2,000 published experiments and they found that young people have significantly lower levels of drug and alcohol abuse, criminal delinquency and attempted suicide. Happiness. The Gallup survey on religion in America concluded that people who agree with God, that agree that God is very important in their lives, are twice as likely to report being very happy in contrast to an atheist. So God makes you happy, man. Um, so be happy, people. Yeah. Also, political scientist Robert Putnam, he surveyed 200 volunteer organizations and it showed there was a positive correlation between religiosity and membership of volunteer organizations. Take the Index of Global Philanthropy in 2007, it states, which you don't state, religious people are more charitable than, not, than non-religious, not only given to their own congregations, but also regardless of income and other demographic variables. So, you know, I think it's another outdated cliche from the atheist. Again, with your apples and oranges, again, I'm saying to you, the, I'm treating the universe as an object that has a spatial, temporal boundary like we've discussed. We could argue this again until the cows come home. Then you mentioned maybe something like a multiverse. Look, philosophically the multiverse for me doesn't make sense for about seven reasons. Number one, the multiverse remains a hypothesis and is very highly speculative, okay? It's a highly speculative mathematical exercise. Two, I would say it's immature and it's a speculative theory bringing a lot of difficulties. Three, if we consult Occam's razor, Multiverse, bloated universe, single God, bloated universe, single God. What's the most comprehensive and simple explanation here? Also, spontaneous quantum fluctuations create more questions than it answers. How did, can a spontaneous quantum fluctuation create a universe? That's the question that you have to understand. It lacks rational force. Also, the universe, the multiverse itself is described by specific physical laws. Don't these laws themselves include constants and boundary conditions, which have to be fine-tuned in the first place? So I think the, fine, the multiverse argument is a non-argument. It's just basically an atheist wanting to push God out of the question all the time. Also, I want to finally end with one argument I didn't address, which was the problem of evil. The big atheist argument. You should, you should spend 20 minutes on that. I think that's a strong argument. And basically, the problem of evil is saying that God is all good and he's all powerful, but there's a lot of evil, gratuitous evil, therefore he can't exist. But I think there are some assumptions here. First and foremost, it assumes that God is just good and just omnipotent, he's just all powerful. But in Islamic theology, we have 99 names and attributes of God that we can reconcile with reality. One of these include, he's the wise. So there's wisdom behind these things. And you may say, but I can't see the wisdom in the baby having cancer. That's fair enough. And we feel for this as well. But the issue is, it doesn't mean the wisdom's not there. That's an argument for ignorance. It's a logical fallacy. Argumentum ad ignoration. Also, it assumes that God doesn't have any morally justified reasons to permit evil in the first place. And I think he does. First and foremost, I, our primary purpose is not to have a party. It's not to boogie, okay? That's not our primary purpose. Our primary purpose is to basically know and worship God. That's the reality of who we are. Also, God created us for a test, and part of this test is to be tested with suffering and evil. As the Quran says, the one who created death and life. So he may put you to test to find which of you is best in deeds. He's the Almighty, the All-Forgiving. Also, God has given us free will, and this makes sense of personal human evil. Because if you didn't have free will, then it's like God making you do good all the time. If you made a universe that all human beings were always doing good, Therefore, there is no morality anymore because it's like someone forcing you to do good all the time, which doesn't make sense of you being a moral agent in the first place. But I think the undercutting defeater to the problem of evil is actually, what do you mean by evil? Do you mean it's objective? It's real? If that's the case, then it necessitates God's existence. Because God is the only metaphysical grounding that makes objective values objective. Because God is the conceptual anchor that transcends human subjectivity. So for you to claim that there's objective evil, it necessitates God's existence. Now if you say, well, it's not objective, which I don't want to build a straw man, but I heard some of your stuff, you don't believe in objective anything. If that's the case, your argument is probabilistic. It's like me, which is not a very strong argument in the first place. Um, also, I don't know how long I've got left. That's not too bad. Well done. <laughs> Um, I would like, if you can, for us to really start to engage with each other, especially with the audience, especially with the unique literary form of the Qur'an, because you didn't bring any undercutting defeaters to the unique literary form of the Qur'an. You didn't understand it by the sounds of it. 
You didn't bring any undercutting defeaters with regards to how the Quran talks about reality in a way that's not contingent on 7th century Arabia. The example I gave, you didn't address. You didn't even give any undercutting defeaters to the existence of God. You just have an issue about terminology, which is not an undercutting defeater. So really, from a philosophical perspective, you didn't break down the arguments. And the funny thing is, you never constructed any arguments for your particular worldview. Now, on the point of the Qur'an posing threats, well, the Qur'an is saying very clear. Let's be holistic when we read this. It says, don't blame God what happens to you metaphysically. Blame yourself. It's the cause and effect from a spiritual perspective. God is not threatening you with this. In actual fact, the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, he was so worried about human beings. He was the true humanist. Because he didn't want people to suffer in this life or the hereafter. He didn't want people to go to hell. This is why he wanted to spread Islam as much as possible to engage with human beings and just give them simply the message. And you have to realize that the Quran is an intellectual and emotional text that intrudes in the inner dimensions of man. And the way it does that is by asking questions. As I said before, And thus we explain our signs in detail for those who reflect. Thank you. So I want to talk, I want to ask you both a question about uh, kind of the underlying view of what you both seem to take rationalism or rational to mean, which is some kind of commitment to evidence. Um, and so, so I'll ask, you know, I'll ask Hamza first, I think. So you're concerned with, with reasons for believing right, that the uh, the Quran is inexplicable naturalistically, so there must be uh, a non-naturalistic explanation. And you see the lack of agreement uh, or the absence of a naturalistic explanation of the origin of the universe as uh, both giving a reason to believe and as in, in making space for God. So I want to press you a little more on this God of the gaps thing that Dan brought up. Uh, I wonder what, how you would react if over the next five years um, the community of astronomers and cosmologists all reached consensus on a naturalistic explanation of the origin of the universe. They, uh, they had you know, all agreed had a good case for just natural causes explaining the origin of the universe. Do you? I just wonder which goes. Does the commitment to reason or, or naturalistic explanations go, or does your faith go? This is a very good question. Because it intrudes in the inner dimension of my own personal environment. And this, is very, this is the kind of question that we should be asking each other, right? See, I think in Islamic theology there's no differentiation between faith and reason. The word Iman, which means faith, actually comes from the word to feel secure. And to feel secure with the belief to have a yaqeen, a certainty of something. So, in, in our belief, we believe our belief must be based on a formal certainty now. That doesn't mean now you define rationalism as scientism. There's a difference here. You don't believe in a very kind of logical positivist 1960s out day view on everything must be verified. We don't have that. We take rationalism to mean something else. And the reason we reject scientism, not science itself, but just scientism is the only way to form conclusions about life, is because, well, firstly, it's self refuting, because the statement itself that scientism is the only way to form conclusions about life can't be proven using science. Yeah? Also, science can't prove logical truths, necessary truths like mathematics. One plus one is equal to two. And you need logical, necessary truths in order to have scientism or science in the first place. To argue the way around would be like a dog trying to catch his tail. So we don't, we say yes, it's useful and it's necessary and it's reality, but we have other aspects of methodologies we use to form conclusions about life. Now, coming to your main question, the, there's no differentiation between what we say the aql and the naql, which basically means the intellect and the text itself. Like Ibn Taymiyyah, one of the famous classical scholars, actually elaborated on this, that if you do think carefully and you look at reality, there's always a correspondence to the text anyway. That's our premise, that's our axiom. Just like science, the axiom is the external world exists. And you can't even prove the external world exists because I know Dan Barker's brain is not on Mars and there's an alien with probes in it saying you're in this room and you must be angry today. 
Yeah? How do you know he's saying that? I mean, you, don't, you, know, you, don't, you can't prove that. It's an axiom. It's, it's a presupposition you need to build your world view. So our axiom is there's no differentiation between the text and reason and text and reality in the first place. So the question itself, what would go, is like saying both of them would go. Do you see? So, but I do take your point. I would say that, I would say we have to cross the bridge when we get there because of my axiom, because there is no differentiation between sound reason and the text itself. So if that is my axiom, then when I see evidence, I have to approach it as it is when we get there. I think that's the best way of answering it. Is that right? Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Can I get to answer that? Um, and I want to ask a similar, similarly spirited question of Dan. So uh, you also are concerned with being responsive to natural evidence uh, and the total absence of natural evidence so you know, is, is your main reason for, uh, for saying rejecting belief in God is rational. But beyond that, you, you said that if you, were, if you came face to face with God, uh, you would reject him on the grounds of the existence of hell and uh, the evil of the universe, right? He did a bad thing. Uh, and so you would reject submission to God. Uh, this is a different understanding of rational, right, the, the evidence response of it. It's for moral reasons that you would reject submission to God. And so I guess I, guess I wonder why you don't worry that, uh, that the revulsion you feel at hell, if it exists, why you don't worry that that makes you uh, insensitive to the sorts of naturalistic explanations that Hamza wants to offer as evidence for God? Yeah, I don't think um, having a moral reservation to a book like the Quran is the same thing as being angry. If that God did exist, I might choose to be angry at that God. I think what's happening here is that what I say about the Quran and Allah and Muhammad makes you angry. And so you project that anger back on me. And you think that I'm angry, therefore, because you think what I'm saying makes you angry. So psychologically, I can't be angry at something that doesn't exist. And to answer your question, um, science is observation. Basic science is observation. Uh, science builds from the bottom up. Uh, science can test hypotheses from the top down, but the hypothesis falls if the observation doesn't fit. So, if I did come face to face with a deity, and there was evidence and proof of it, and I could shake his hand or whatever, then my acceptance of the existence of that being could be very positive. It doesn't follow that I would necessarily respect and admire that being. I might say, Okay, Allah exists, but he's beneath my dignity of worship. I would never bow down. I would never submit to them. I would rather spend an eternity in hell with the skin being burned off my arms and being regrown than pretend to worship such a monster that would create a thing like hell. And when I say something like that, a lot of you get angry and you think, oh, Dan's angry, right? But uh, wouldn't you be angry? Wouldn't you be angry at somebody who used threats of violence to make their point? As I said earlier, any system of thought that contains a threat of physical violence is morally bankrupt. If you want to call that anger, fine. I just call that a moral outrage at the kind of thinking that has that, uh, for a book that contains thoughts like that. So uh, I think it was Richard Feynman who said, um, it was Feynman, uh, the first principle in science is that you should not fool yourself. And you are the easiest person to fool. Uh, if you come to a religion that you're born into or that you adopt, you are fooling yourself. You are deluding yourself. Science is a way to externalize and get outside of that and say, I'm going to follow science wherever it leads. Uh, notice that Hamza did not actually answer the question. He just said, we'll have to cross that bridge when it comes to it. But the question is very simple. Since we do know about thunder and lightning, Thor does not exist. Thor is gone. We have the day of the week. Thor does not exist. And if you're basing your evidence for Allah on a gap of a, of a lack of understanding about the origin of the Big Bang, which is the argument that you presented today, was your leading argument of why it's consistent with Allah, 
His question is, what if that gap does close? What if it turns out that there is evidence for the multiverse? And by the way, the multiverse is admittedly a hypothesis, but so is God. They're both hypotheses. By the way, the multiverse is a simpler hypothesis than a creative being who has this complex mind. That, that takes more... Uh, that's, that's, if we're going to follow Occam's razor, a multiverse is a simpler idea than this idea of this being that exists without any explanation of its own. So, uh, you did not answer the question. And uh, I think I did answer your question. I, I would believe, yes, if there were evidence, I would believe and I would say I was wrong, I would admit it. But that doesn't follow that I would admire or respect any of those gods in the revealed religions. This is a question for Hamza. Uh, why would Allah depend on humans to spread his message? Thank you for the question, dear questioner. Um, why would Allah depend on humans to spread his message? Well, there are two things here, first and foremost. We believe that is we don't guide people, we don't bring people to the truth. I mean, we believe that you know, be, between the fingers of Allah is the hearts of man. And the word qalb, which is heart, means something that wavers. And you know, our hearts always waver, don't they? And, and we believe that's in the control of God. So what we're saying is we don't really guide anyone. Uh, human beings, what we do as Muslims, we believe it's a, it's, it's a duty and obligation of human, human beings to present the truth. I mean, it's a natural thing that people do. If you really like your soccer team, you're going to say to everybody, you must support the soccer team. David Beckham is such a good guy. He's handsome. He's got a British accent. Okay, he sounds sometimes like a woman, but that's a different story, yeah? But the point is, he used to play for Manchester United, you know? Um, so you to support that team, you know, the truth of that team. Similarly with people's world views, that this is like something more important because you purpose and meaning in life, so you're going to promote it. Just like, this is why we have groups like Cash. I mean, why are they there? To come together and start discussing different ideas and maybe their particular world view. So it's a natural thing. So God is telling us, you will be rewarded spiritually as a result of calling people to this beautiful religion. And we believe if you call people to, to the values of Islam, you will solve things like poverty. Like the number one economic problem in this planet is the problem of distribution of wealth. Capitalism is a sick disease. And in my humble opinion, must be eradicated, intellectually of course, uh, as best as possible. Because according to UNDP report, for example, there are 250, billion, 250 people who own more wealth than 2 billion people on this planet. But we have enough resources. It's an outdated geopolitical myth that there's not enough resources. According to the Food Agriculture Organization, there's enough calories on this planet to feed about three planets. We're greedy. That's what capitalism has done for us. You know, the professor from Maryland University, Professor Koran, actually says that the aspect of greed supports the capitalist model. Growth, growth, growth. So the point is, when we call people to this beautiful religion, not only is it saving you from this damnation, but also it's actually solving human problems, like poverty. This is why the Jews, when Islamic um, values like economics was implemented in history, the Jews came to our lands. For example, a rabbi, and you can find this letter in the book called Constantinople by Philip Mansell. And a rabbi writes from 1453 and he says, Oh my brethren, oh my Jewish brothers, come to the land of the Turks, the land of the Muslims. Rich are the fruits of the earth. We're not oppressed with heavy taxes. We have freedom and we live in peace. That's because some of the values of Islam, like economic justice, the distribution of wealth, was apparent. This is what we want for people as well. It's not just about this kind of metaphysical thing, we're going to save you from hellfire, you're going to feel closer to God, you're fulfilling your own purpose, which is all very important, but it's also about dealing with human problems. And we believe we should be having the discussions, what does Islam have to say about economics? You know, these kind of amazing things, and we believe that we have the solution, which is solving the issue of distribution of wealth. If you look into the zakat system, the, the alms giving and the supergatory giving of charity and the aspect of removing interest and the resources of, 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 of a particular land belongs to the people, not just to the elite. When you see this principle, you see an amazing economic model. So we want to call people to these values too. So to answer the question, which maybe you think I'm answering the question, is that God is asking us to call people to peace, and that's the reality. Peace in this life, and peace in the hereafter. And this is why God uses human agents to do that. And that's the sunnah, which means the way, the method, 
of God. He always sent messengers to communicate. And what better thing to sit down with another human being and just to communicate with each other. Imagine you sent an angel or something. You can't relate to an angel. We're not angels, surely. Yeah? We relate to human beings. That's probably the most rational, logical thing to do. But I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Next one for Dan. Um, what, is it that, uh, what, is it, what is it that keeps your common man from committing crimes if it's not fear of punishment? There are some people that do need the fear of punishment. Um, on the bell curve of human characteristics, there are some people over here on the tail end, the sociopaths, the psychopaths who are not mentally healthy for either genetic or environmental reasons, we don't understand why. In fact, 4% of our species are sociopathic. Uh, we do need to build jails and have systems of justice for those people. But the general body, most of you in this room, I think, uh, it's not the fear of punishment that's making you be good. Are you trying to tell me that if it weren't for God or for the law, you're going to go out and start raping and killing? Is that what you naturally are as a human being? We come prepackaged with instincts that are positive and negative from our ancestors. We come prepackaged with instincts toward altruism, toward empathy. We share that with other primates and other animals who also cooperate and share because it's good for the species. We're a social species. We evolve from ancestors who found it beneficial to cooperate and share and have these altruistic, empathetic impulses. Why do you hold the door open for the person next to you? Why do you, without thinking, reach to grab a baby that's falling? That happened to me once. These are, these are natural instincts. We are naturally good people on balance. Uh, it depends where you fall in that bell curve. So we don't need laws for that. We only need laws for the extremes. If you read the headlines, it makes it look like, whoa, the human race is really violent. But actually, Steven Pinker's new book, uh, The Better Angels of Our Nature, shows we are actually less violent now than ever. Leave human beings alone, we are a peaceful, loving, caring, sharing bunch of people. Those are headlines because they're headlines. When you see a horrible headline of some horrible thing that somebody did, a Christian or a Muslim fundamentalist or an Orthodox Jew or whoever, or an, or an atheistic Stalin, you see them doing some horrible things, you think, what's the first thing you say? What an inhuman thing to do. We assume that the human thing to do is good, kind, sharing, compassionate, altruistic, which comes with us through our evolutionary heritage. So um, I, I can tell you right now, I'm not holding the door open for the person behind me because I'm afraid I'm going to be punished if I don't, or because I want reciprocal altruism from that person uh, if I don't do that. Um, by the way, there are other studies that contradict your, the studies you show about uh, charity and the religious. George Barna, for example, uh, he's a born-again Christian, has studied born-again Christians, and he says there's no difference. In fact, uh, atheists and agnostics are underrepresented in prisons. Uh, and besides, it's irrelevant. Uh, if some people do need religion to be good, to be charitable, that, that, kind, of, that kind of diminishes their, their moral impulse for being good because they're afraid of, of, commit, of, of going to hell or because they want to get uh, you know, rewarded in a heaven forever. But um, the, uh, the, the average believer, it's kind of like saying, oh, look at how the behavior of children improves dramatically during the middle months, during the middle weeks of the month of December. The promise of Santa Claus, and look at how things improve. Well, if you need that, well then by all means, let's believe in Santa Claus, because Santa Claus, believe in Santa Claus improves the behavior of children. Does that mean Santa Claus is real? That's a totally different question. If belief in God does improve people's morality, that doesn't mean that God is real. It just means they're, they're externally motivated to do good rather than internally motivated. Uh, this is another for Hamza. Uh, more on the um, natural explanation stuff. The question is, does God, does God influence people's lives uh, in some kind of empirically measurable way? I know you cited the well-being research that shows that uh, people who participate in religious institutions are frequently happier. I think the question is, uh, is there, well, that's any religious participation, right? Is there some reason to think that Allah, uh, is he detectable in the, uh, in, a detectable influence in the lives of Muslims? 
Um, that, that's a very good question, which relates to the comment that Dan Barker was actually talking about when he was saying there's evidence that born again Christians, that there's no correlation between differences of religious or atheist groups. But then again, I was talking about longitudinal studies that don't just include born again Christians, but all religions. So you can't use you know, thousands of academic studies and bring something that's very small based on a specific community within the Christian community. That, that, that doesn't follow. And what I'm saying here is not that you need the moral motivation of fear of hell to do good. All we're saying is the concept of God and loving Him and wanting to come close to Him actually is, a, is an added moral motivation to do good. So it takes already good people and makes them better. That, that's the point I'm trying to make. Now, in regards to, you know, should, does the belief in Allah, does it change human life? That's, that's the point here. Well, it should, essentially. You know, the belief in God or the belief in having an ultimate purpose, an ultimate, ultimate vision, an ultimate meaning in life should change your life because you're not in an existential anxiety anymore. Because if you really think about the logical conclusion of an atheist worldview, then we have a self-delusion. Because we say, I have purpose, I want to be a preacher, I want to be a Dan Barker, I want to be an engineer, I want to be a doctor. But it's self-delusion because it's basically saying, let's pretend to have purpose. Because the underlying reality of our life is almost purposeless. And this is why the French existentialists like Jean-Paul Sartre and many others who talked about the nausea of existence. Albert Jamus, the half French, half Algerian philosopher said, existence is nauseating because it's purposeless. Why is it here? Arthur Schopenhauer, what did he say? He wrote an essay on suicide. So did David Hume, by the way. Um, and basically, Schopenhauer was, Arthur Schopenhauer was basically saying, I wish the universe never existed because he really thought about existence itself. And I would argue that many of us, we don't think about existence anymore, what it means to exist. You know why? We have the iPhone, we have email, we have Facebook, we have Twitter, we have kids, we have nine to five. Or in America, it's like eight to eight. You work guys work too hard, man. Yeah? <laughs> and you have capitalism, the drive to earn more, 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 more. We define ourselves by a lot of external things sometimes, unfortunately. Yeah? So the point is, we have all these things that veil our thinking. There was a Times Magazine study done that took normal professionals and said to them, think about your life for 12 hours. No work, no nothing. Think. 80% of them, more than 80%, they broke down. Because they suspended those existential questions. What does it mean to be me? What does it mean to exist? And that's why the Quran talks about this existential question saying, if you reject God, God will make you reject your own self. Because the, worshiping God is so intrinsic to who you are. Because you're going to worship something anyway. You submit yourself to the pilot when you're on the plane. You know when they go on the plane to the pilot saying, I don't want to submit to you, let me ride the plane. Yeah, and then you have to pray to God because you're going to die, man. Yeah, as I say, there's no atheist on the sinking ship. Uh, which is quite interesting because there was a study done about the Titanic, right? And when, when, when there were people who were like basically on the boats and they were freezing and they would die of pneumonia or whatever they call hypothermia, and all the atheists were actually, well, guess what they were doing? They were praying. They were praying. What else are they going to do? You must have pray. Yeah? So that was quite interesting. I thought it was a funny thing to add anyway. Um, I can send you the link. It's BBC files. BBC British something broadcasting, yeah? Anyway, so the point is, God should have an effect on your lives. And we believe adopting the concept of oneness of God should have an effect on your life. Think about it. If you accept that there's a one powerful deity being that you should worship and that's your life, that frees you from the shackles of creation. It shouldn't give you an inferiority complex anymore. It means that you don't have a lack of self-esteem. It means that you can't blame aspects of the material world for your problems. You take responsibility now. You don't have this kind of abstract determinism, like, oh, it's social conditioning, I'm always going to be like this. That's what the Quran says, take responsibility. It's a very existential point it's trying to say. Now, think about this point that we believe in the Quran. We say, la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. Which basically means, there is no true power apart from the power of God. Imagine you internalize that. Imagine what that can do to a human being. It means that everybody in this room, or any material thing in the world, cannot prevent you from doing the thing that you want to achieve in life. Like, the material doesn't have true power, true efficacy. Because you see, the true power is God. Because everything happens as a result of His power and will. So that frees you. That gives you the intellectual and emotional space to create a new realm of possibility for yourself. Just by that concept. Imagine that, if you internalize that concept. 
Fine, if you don't believe in it, and well, that's a different discussion. But conceptually, if you were to internalize such a concept, it can free you from these kind of shackles. And it's, and it's called the blind spot. Because we have blind spots in our lives. We know what we know. For example, I know that I'm Greek, because I look Pakistani, yeah? <laughs> I know, for example, uh, that I have a white shirt on, right? I know I've gained weight recently, yeah? <laughs> It's your pancakes, beautiful dining. American diners are the best, man. Wake up in the morning, have your cakes, over eat cakes, uh, eggs over easy, beautiful. That's capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. Not really. It's called food. <laughs> it's, it's a bit of a difference. I mean, communists don't eat, socialists don't eat. You know what? The only people that eat are capitalists. Yeah? Anyway, so the point I'm trying to say is, the point I'm saying, I know, I know that I know certain things, but I also know that I don't know certain things. For example, I don't know anything about rocket science, so I know that I don't know about rocket science. But there's an aspect of our life that we don't know, that we don't know, that we don't know. And that's what you call the blind spot in your life. And you could only free that if you have concepts like there is no true power but God because it gives you the new realm of possibility to achieve things that you can achieve. It's an existential point. It's, it's, it's quite deep but it requires more discussion but that's the point I'm trying to say. Uh, tea talk? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I've selected a couple that are, that are more on point. It should be short, concise answers. <laughs> um, so this is for Dan. Uh, the question is, so, so you said that if something doesn't take up space, it doesn't exist. Do the following things exist? Time, human will, numbers, gravity. Uh, if so, how much space do they take up? <laughs> so, who's the preacher? <laughs> You're so influential, man. <laughs> You barely touched on the answer, but uh, I'm, I, I agree with you. I need a chance to preach. You know, I was a preacher. Did you know the word reverend was a typo? Did you know that? The first letter was originally an N. <laughs> Time is not a thing. Time is not a thing. Time is a concept. It's a dimension. Uh, it's like, um, how tall is this podium? Well, we measure it, we, we assign a zero point to this podium, and then we measure so many centimeters up to here. But how long is the dimension? It's meaningless to talk about how long is the dimension. It's a, it's, it, there is no such thing as a dimension. It's a concept in our brains by which we make measurements. So time and space, and those things are dimensions. Um, the other concepts that we talk about, yes, there are many concepts that exist, but a concept exists only within a brain. Just because I have a concept of something, doesn't mean that it exists out there. That's called reification. Uh, when a brain is functioning and it's, it's making labels to refer to objects or, or other functionings of the brain, even the word mind is just a description of a function. There's no such thing as a mind. There's only a, the only thing is the brain. Uh, then these things can be measured. You can look at mental activity. You can look at neuron, neurons firing, and you can say, "Oh yes, that person is having a concept within their brain." But things like, like uh, you know, love and justice and free will, those are labels for concepts that de define actions. They're not actually. You can't go out and buy love at a store. You can't go out and measure justice. You can't. You know, you can use. You can. You know, physically, uh, but. Uh, 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 if a God exists, a God is a being with a functioning mind of some sort. Somehow this mind is functioning. And it's functioning in a, in a complex way. This mind is functioning in a, uh, in, a, in a way that you would say, well, if you found a watch on the ground and it was functioning, you would have to say, wow, how can that just be functioning without a designer? Well, isn't the mind of the designer even more functional and more complex than the thing that it designed? If there is this all-powerful Allah, its functioning brain has to be some kind of a thing up there, and by by the own, you know, by the design argument reasoning, that God also has to have a God, because otherwise you're just explaining one mystery with another mystery. You haven't explained anything. What evolution does is explains complexity not from more complexity, but com how complexity arises from simplicity. So uh, I, I think it's a mistake. Whoever asked the question, 
Uh, there's a tendency to reify a concept to turn it into a thing, and to think that and God is a concept, and in, in Hamza's mind, that concept becomes a thing. He actually thinks God exists in reality somewhere. He actually thinks that that idea that was in the mind of Muhammad is actually a being that exists somewhere outside of reality. He's reifying or deifying a concept. I think uh, we're pretty much out of time. One more question. Um, again, a uh, pretty focused one. Uh, the writing styles of the authors Emily Dickinson and E. e. Cummings are very unique. Does this make them messengers of Allah? <laughs> yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, what do you mean by unique? That's the question. Now, I would argue that if you look at every single piece of literature, if a blueprint exists, you can emulate its literary form. For example, in English language, we have the iambic pentameter. In Greek language, we have various forms. In the Arabic language, we have poetry, for example, that have to adhere to the 16 rhythmical patterns called the al-bihar, and so forth and so forth. You have these literary forms. I'm not talking about aesthetic reception. How do they use the rhetorical devices? Where are the embellishments? Where is the eloquence? You know, we're not really talking about this. Well, that's an argument in itself. I'm talking about the structural features of a particular language. When you speak in English, there's only certain forms that you could speak in. Poetry, normal speech, prose, half prose, etc. What, what kind of poetic forms you use. Those are not entirely unique. You just have to use them because you're expressing yourself in a particular language. What I'm saying is that the Quran itself de-scopes the Arabic language. Every time you're trying to express yourself, you're never going to achieve the literary form of the Quran even though you, you exhaust the finite grammatical rules, the finite letters of the Arabic language, and the finite words. This is what we mean by an act of impossibility, because we go to the nature of the event, the event being the Quran, and the nature being the Arabic language, we exhaust all possibilities, and we can't bring the unique literary form of the Quran. And this is why I mentioned Western academics that even support this type of view. Now the point is, if we're thinking human beings, and this is true, well let's think about this. It does make an act of impossibility, and if it does, then it conforms to the description of a miracle that I mentioned in my presentation. It's a valid question, but even when you were to look at these types of uh, works, you would see that there are particular forms that can be replicated, as we gave with the example of Shakespeare and many others. So this is an interesting subject. I mean, for more information, you go to my website, right? It's not selling anything, it's articles, yeah? Uh, Hamzadzorzis.com and under exploring the Quran, there is a chapter called The Challenge of the Quran, which has been authorized by scholars in Medina University in Saudi Arabia as well. And also, if you want more information, you go to the, theinimitablequran.com. You could challenge it, let's have questions, let's have an email dialogue, let's have a discussion. And we basically see the Quran for what it is with regards to its linguistic and literary miracle. So I hope I, I answer the question, give you more food for thought, and maybe an avenue to, to read around as well. An interesting book is Neil Robertson's book. Yeah, he was an Orientalist, and he was from Lancaster University in England, and it's called The Quran, A Contemporary Approach to a Veiled Text. It's in the English language, and it makes you understand the kind of uniqueness of the Quranic discourse. And he actually converted to Islam as a result of that. Uh, it's a highly academic study, but it's also done in layman language. So it's Neil Robinson, the Quran, a unique, a, I forgot what I said. <laughs> it must be, I don't know, what is it? That's it. A, a veil, a something. See what's happening now? <laughs> it's just your energy, man. It's like it's engulfing me. No, I'm only kidding. Anyway, just type in Neil Robinson and the Quran. A contemporary approach to world text. There you go. I found it eventually. Thank you. Anyway, very nice having you guys. Thank you for hosting me. I'm from Britain. I went for immigration, which was a great thing. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to Cash and to Building Blocks and to Dan, to Hands Up. It was a fun night. Bye.